Ready? We are live. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Bice, and I'm the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a steering committee member of the NDP Socialist Caucus. We acknowledge that this gathering takes place on the Indigenous lands, including the unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat and the Audenoshawnee people. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's webcast is titled Proletarian Poetry. I am your host, and I am joined by Chris Wanamaker, George Elliott Clark, Giovanna Riccio, Robert Priest, Susmita Ray, Corey Smith, Malou Baumgarten, uh, Armel Mirage, and Janine Booth. Each will make a presentation of about seven minutes. After that, we will take questions from the online audience if we have time, and we're asking that if we do, that the audience will direct their question to uh, one of the um, poets. So, uh, and, and any member, of course, can submit the question by accessing the webcast directly from YouTube and by typing the question directly on the chat column. Please, so, as I said, please direct to a specific person. If you like this webcast, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree with what you hear during this program, Please join Socialist Action by signing up on our website, www.socialistaction.ca, and by calling 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. Our use of the term proletarian poetry is in no way linked to the false notion of proletarian culture or socialist realism associated with Stalinism. As a modern day revolutionary socialist, we do not object or seek to suppress past artistic achievements as bourgeois. We strive to stand on the shoulders of the great poets of yesteryear to reach greater heights. At the same time, it is a virtue to connect present day art to the struggle and strivings of the working, world working class, the great hope of humanity. And as Bertolt Brecht famously said, art is not a mirror, it is a hammer. So let's begin. So first of all, we're going to go across the pond, as we say, to the UK, to our poet, uh, Janine Booth. And she's a Marxist motor mouth, that's her words, not mine, who performs poetry funny, funny and serious, ranting, rhyming and revolting. Janine performs widely around the UK and has also taken to the stage in Germany, France, Belgium, and Canada, the USA, and Australia. She has five pu published poetry collections and several other books. So take it away, Janine. Thank you very much. This first poem is called Bearing Down. The white power cap on the top of the head of the cop with his knee on the neck of the man on the floor by the passenger door who says, please, I can't breathe. And who calls for his mum, stops responding, goes numb, but still bears the knee on his neck and the weight and the hate of the cop who still wouldn't stop. The weight of the state bears down on the neck of the blacks and the poor and the natives. The law, which claims to be fair, takes aim without care. Justice, a farce based on race and on class. Thank you very much. A short one to uh, that was a short one to to, to start off with. Um, now I'm going to do one about. Um, see, isn't it interesting that during the COVID pandemic this year and the lockdown and stuff. Um, all the people who usually say that uh, free market economics is fabulous have kind of gone quiet or, or you know, joined everyone else in demanding state intervention. And this is a poem about that. Um, and it's called Wherefore Art Thou Capitalism? No one's saying leave it to the market. No one's claiming competition's key. That stockbrokers will lead us from the darkness. No one's sneering now at stuff for free. No one says that laissez-faire will sort it. No one claims that we'll be saved by greed. None declare just those who can afford it should get the test and get the care they need. No one says we need more speculators. 
No one's calling care workers unskilled. No one waits for private ventilators. No one thinks compassion should be built. No one says the rich should keep their fortunes instead of sharing wealth for common good. No one says they wouldn't pull resources to help the sick and frightened if they could. No one says it's fine to charge your damnedest. Supply will match demand and set the prices. No one says that mutual aid is madness. No one trusts a banker in a crisis. So where are Adam Smith and Milton Friedman? Where's triumphant capitalism hiding? Where's the wealth of nations when you need them? Tell the stock exchanges when you find them. Keep your guard for when this crisis passes and profit praisers raise their voice anew. When corporate beggars claim their place as masters, remember solidarity got us through. Tell them that we won't come back to serve them. Tell them profit damages our health. We'll share the riches for we all deserve them and build a democratic commonwealth. Thank you very much. That was in included in an anthology called Coronaverses, um, which if you're interested in, you can buy as an ebook or a print book um, from my website. Um, and I'm going to leave you with one more because I, for me, proletarian policy is often about explicit issues like those two poems already done about. But sometimes it's about working class life and um, the way that capitalism restricts our opportunities and um, even you know gets in the way of people even doing stuff like 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 this um so inspired by a line in a book which describes someone as an author of several unpublished books um i wrote this poem it's called unpublished author a traveler to worlds of unvisited places a winner of numerous unstarted races a painter of touch-ups that could have been pictures designer of unproduced fittings and fixtures inventor of gadgets that never made patent find skills unfulfilled and fierce passion still latent a cordon bleu chef feeds her kids what she cooks an author of several unpublished books a soldier soprano who sings in the shower, an artist who hires out her craft by the hour, a teller of stories, a co-educator, a thinker, philosopher, poet, creator, composer of lullabies heard just at home. Her life may stand still, but her mind likes to roam. A scrawler of lines stuffed in crannies and nooks, an author of several unpublished books. A washer of dishes, a wiper of arses, a lister of wishes, a dropout from classes where muse could have struck. She was clearing out she was clearing out muck or out earning a buck or so tired she got stuck. A riser at dawn, she's a clock in and outer, she's patched up and worn, she's a serial self-doubter. The sleaze ball at work says so she's losing her looks, an author of several unpublished books. She'd dance in the dusk, but her neighbour's abusive. Containerised living is hardly conducive. She'd love to be noticed, but the breaks are elusive. The one time she tried, the reply was conclusive. Divisor of plot lines and writer of hooks and author of several unpublished books. A worker of overtime, Christmas is nearing, toiling in noise, getting harder of hearing, watch time grinding onwards, her dreams disappearing, her subconscious critic is constantly jeering. She's one of those stars whom our world overlooks, an author of several unpublished Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the poetry. I've been Janine Boo. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. These, these poems were just very inspiring. Thank you so, so much. Okay, so our next uh, poet, we're going to go to New Brunswick, and it's Chris Wanamaker. Uh, he's an NDP Socialist Caucus, and he is a member of Socialist Action. He is the host of a new community radio show, The Open Mic, A Literary Journey Into Words. Chris's poetry often has a social justice theme. He has shared his spoken creation at venues in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, and in New Brunswick. So welcome, Chris, if you would like to introduce yourself and get your mic working there. Yes, yeah, certainly. Can you hear me okay at the moment? Yes, I can. Shall I uh, go ahead? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I, I uh, have decided to read my favorite social justice poem of all time, although maybe after this evening that will change. But my favorite social justice poem is one by Rene Otto Castillo 
He uh, was a Nicaraguan, sorry, he was a a Guatemalan revolutionary guerrilla fighter and poet and activist. And he lived from 1937 to 1967. And uh, when he returned to Guatemala after being exiled in El Salvador, he uh, joined the guerrilla struggle with the rebel armed forces. And eventually he was captured by government forces and taken to government army barracks where he was interrogated, tortured and burned alive. But he was very active in progressive politics throughout his life. And this is a poem called A Political Intellectuals, again by Otto Rene Castillo. One day, the apolitical intellectuals of my country will be interrogated by the humblest of our people. They will be asked what they did when their country was slowly dying out like a sweet campfire, small and abandoned. No one will ask them about their dress or their long siestas after lunch or about their futile struggles against this or about their ontological way to make money. No, they won't be questioned on Greek mythology or about the self-disgust they felt when someone deep inside them was getting ready to die the coward's death. They will be asked nothing about their absurd justifications Uh, Their absurd justifications, nurtured in the shadow of a huge lie, on that day the humble people will come, those who never had a place in the books and poems of the apolitical intellectuals, but who daily delivered their bread and milk, their eggs and tortillas, those who mended their clothes, those who drove their cars, those who took care of their dogs and gardens and worked for them. And they will ask, what did you do when the poor suffered, when tenderness and life were daily burning out in them? A political intellectuals of my sweet country, you will have nothing to say. A vulture of silence will eat your gut. Your own misery will gnaw at your souls, and you will be mute in your shame. I think that's uh, actually quite a powerful poem. Uh, The next one is my own poem, and uh, it's simply called Blessed. Blessed are you if you thirst for justice. Blessed are you if you work to deny the influence of international investors, help organize massive mobilization in the streets. Blessed are you if you take direct action, dismantle the architecture of corporate impunity, decentralize and declare your disobedience, ask to decolonize Columbus Day. Blessed are you if you divest, help the workers in transnational corporations, organize their strikes, connect with collectives, march against Monsanto, bring cases to the People's Tribunal. Blessed are you if you place the planet before profit, help end extractivism. you if you occupy, occupy the factory, occupy the legislature, occupy the square of the UN, build a bridge between the UN and the outside world. Blessed are you if you confront corporate power, the consolidation of corporate capital, if you defend our political imaginary, help reclaim our juridical power and prevent the privatization of democracy. Blessed are you if you rise up against foreign occupation, land grabs, and sea piracy. If you join the movements against tobacco, fast foods, fossil fuel, private water, help end decades of deception, deceit, disinformation. Blessed are you if you bring the murder of blacks and the deaths of indigenous women to the People's Tribunal. If you insist the UN regulations on international corporations binding. If you work to tear trade agreements, blessed are you if you help weave a red thread into U.S. treaties and expropriate the system of international law for the people. Blessed are you if you oppose war, if you work to rescue the world's 60 million refugees. Blessed are you if you learn how to catch energy from the sun and free yourself of money and oil. 
Blessed are you who live a life that makes you one with the universe. If you understand the sacredness and interconnectedness of all things, if you grow corn, bean, and squash, take only what you need, give back the rest as a disciple of Mother Earth. Blessed are you if you respect the order of the universe, contribute to the cosmic harm, and not let the chaos of capitalism rule. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. And that's it. Thank you very much, Chris. It was wonderful. Okay, so we will now uh, come back to Toronto. Uh, to George Eliot Clark, who is Canada's first black national poet laureate. He served in that capacity in 2000. George's poetry is no tradition. Somebody got your mic. Oh, yes. George, can you hold your mic until it's time for you George has chronicled the experience and history of Black Canadian communities in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, creating a cultural geography that he has coined as Africadia. So welcome, George. Yeah, uh, here I am, unmuted. It's great to be here. Um, the first poem I want to read is uh, The Ballad of the Black Megantic Disaster. For those who don't know about that disaster, this was a, a, a tragedy that unfurled uh, in 2013 when a freight train rolled downhill into a, uh, a Quebec town where most of the residents were asleep. It was the middle of the night. And uh, as it uh, reached the bottom of its plunge down the hill, it burst into flames uh, and ended up uh, killing, essentially incinerating 43 people uh, as they either slept or were about the town in pubs and so on. So here it is, the ballad of the Lac Megantic disaster. I apologize for not being able to sing. Rail Co, Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic was okay to let one guy staff or stall a train. Downhill, slept, and the engineer booked off July 6, 2013, post midnight, while locomotives snorted spit, sparks, and spat smoke, their black freight, a real fright, 72 cars left to sit, seemingly at rest, parked until sunrise with steel drum seas of black crude oil, a feasible firestorm left without eyes to watch air brakes, but catches fail. The train was unflinching as it inched free of bricks that had just broken down. After 1 a.m. and oil, a black sea shuffled loose, now rolled, set to drown a town in tides of fire, in delicate, unholy, obscene, to slather citizens and streets in a blitz of spit, a greased spritz of flaming lather. Wheels vacated blatantly where they'd stopped. Those tanker cars tipped now downhill. Parallel rails let nothing interrupt as the freight squeaked, squealed, squalled, brutal, and began to hurtle, no more halting, and careened, quite terrifying. Wheels not just turning, but somersaulting, brought death. Huge cannonballs flying, next expropriating, devastating flames, equivalent to an onslaught of napalm, bombs, blanding grass hut frames, as in Vietnam. Now a juggernaut, the train disintegrated atomic to desolate and immolate that town, lack megantic, vitriolic, the petrol, black ejaculate, smothered, suffocated, who didn't burn or blaze to gore each face charred, scorched, identities none could discern, showed where scathing fuels tarred and torched. The exploding freight dismantled the town unilateral like God's whims. A toxic concoction besmirched each noun, 
smoke smeared and smudged, choking off hymns. The rollicking colic of septic air had all still breathing now coffin. The purgative disaster that chanced here cankered survivors sobs punctured laughing. At the inquest, only the tired got blamed for the damage, the dirt, the deaths. Few had to cringe, crouch low as they got named, damned for coffin slim monoliths. But the disaster that's lacked in antique marks no jinx. The injustice was no runaway train. Greed gone frantic may discount corpses countless. The thirst for black ink can turn a blood sport when profits the trophy and scorned is safety some business's last resort, despite being sued, threatened, fined, and warned. Too many lie dead at Lac Megantique. Most do mainly to one mistake, failure that allegedly turned tragic, expense cutting that had no break, expense cutting that had no break. Uh, the second poem is uh, in the voice of Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, talking about how she meets Joseph, who of course is a carpenter. So this is Mary speaking. She says, now Joey was secretly a green-eyed, brown-skinned Black Panther. Here's our beginning. At the annual Color Jerusalem picnic, gumbo, chicken, and rice, once night stars and furled folks cracked up guitars, Joey would unleash bluesy saxophone, black as a soul train and soulful as coal train. I remember tippy-toeing heels to synagogue alongside my papa as a young girl. I'd ignore the wolf whistling boys. I couldn't dare turn around. Father was a cattle dealer who found run down kind, fattened them prodigiously, then auctioned them at a profit. Joe got autodidact carpentry by watching others measuring, <laughs> sawing, hammering, nailing, planing, and or gluing. He worked on shingles, small repairs. We all saw some dudes crushed by slipping logs. Joe toiled in the woods until 17, cut wood for 20 cents a day, then 50 cents a day. He went on the river drive once he was 17. He told me about the lemon peel scent of rain-dusted groves, neon bright avocado green versus destitute olive green, how waters come rushing in, ambushing like lightning. He advised, I'd rather you study Eastern philosophy, Mary, than East Coast poetry. First ale, then ale mints, then ale again. That's Joey's elemental system. Thank you very much, George. Thank you so, so much. Okay, so next up is Giovanna Riccio, is a graduate of the University of Toronto, where she majored in philosophy. She is the author of Vittorio Lyrical Miracle Press, 2010, Strong Bread Quattro Books, 2011, and Plastics Republic, 2019. Her poems have appeared in national and international publications. Translations of her work have been published in Italian, French, Spanish, and Romanian. So welcome, Giovanna. Hi, everybody. So glad to be here and uh, to celebrate proletarian poetry, which I was reading as a young, young girl, thanks to my father. Okay, I'm going to start with my poem, Planting Light. This is a poem I wrote for uh, the workers at the Oshawa plant, which was closed down this last spring, uh, despite their struggle to have it uh, converted into a, an e-vehicle plant uh, funded by the government. The government decided to fund the oil companies instead. Anyway, uh, they're still struggling and we're still hopeful. So this is called Planting Light. My lungs ache, my chest tightens, when I remember the Skylark's grounded wings, the mangled contract, how fossil fuel tycoons every day get away with murder. 
while snug in private planes, smug GM execs jet through workday rainbows, incinerating four generations of auto workers. All the while, they're mouthing, emitting do good or bunk as secretly they idle the clock. About concessions and two tiered wages. Assembly lines rear ended as they pile up dinero. Tight lipped about billions in lapsed loans or in cahoots politicians. Forgive and forget about GM on the dole, pocketing bailouts as backhanded bounty. So corporate bums ride on the taxpayer's dime then crash the books till numbers combust to a scorched earth policy. And Mary Barra, cushy in the company's stretch limo hearse, driving a geopolitical dirge for Oshawa, hitching our unallocated plant to a no rules playbook, steering daily bread south to another maquiladora spewing cars and trucks to line GM's pockets with beggared Mexican workers. And far from crude slick beaches, far from goals glazed in black gold, oily mollocks blew barrels at Eco's side, blind to babes barter to Exxon and the Koch brothers, deaf to teens exhausted by the internal combustion engine choking on tomorrow going up in smoke. Brave and unruly, the young who eye the maple leaf rusting against melting polar ice, who bear witness to the ravaged grandeur of Atlantic right whales, sacrificed to drunken cruise ships and dollar store freight carriers, who flag climate refugees pitched by ocean waves fisting the sky. Too green are they to weather hope flattened by hurricanes, cutting class each Friday to tug the state's ear closer to truth. Aggrieved and grieving, they stare down the UN's fake nod and bigwigs who back away from a future snuffed by the ever thin promise of permanent jobs flowing from trickle-down economics through pipelines into the shareholders' insatiable maw. Cavalier gardens hold hostage their planet, rub out the moon, torch the stars. It's no surprise that Oshawa darkens when a kingpin daddy fuses dream to nightmare and torpedoes the kid next door. But if parents love progeny, they must keep house, be one with earth. One's a number that grows on itself person by person, summons unity, sums pushback and power, nurturing union. Like Vanguard Greta daring one global choir, tuning streets and jungle to emerald anthem, to human harmony, mantled Amazon air. In concert were nature's all indigenous union, seeding a clearing through carbonized sky. And one shouts no to an elderly, orderly wind down. Oshawa seizes the front seat, keeps on the lights. Beacons for citizens, workers hail e-vehicles, laser bulldozer light. A fresh plant electrifies GM's shuttered heart. Again dawns the people's diamond hard light. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to read an unusual poem here from my book, Plastics Republic, which it features a large section called the Barbie Suite. In 2018, Mattel launched a, what's called trying to get their market back, launched an inspirational women's line, which was launched on, if you could believe it, Barbie on International Women's Day. So one of the inspirational dolls that they launched was Frida Kahlo. I think they forgot that she was a communist, an avid and ardent communist, along with uh, Diego Rivera. 
So anyway, inspired by the Frida Kahlo Barbie, I wrote this poem called Kahlo Inspiration, Frida Kahlo Barbie 2018. And it starts with a quote from Mattel, a marketing line, because a girl cannot be what she cannot see, which is not true. Scarred by polio's primer, she painted a death mask toddler gripping a lone flower. Death recharged, derailed a trolley, fractured her spinal column. A high-spirited teenager bound in a gesto white body cast, she munched on pale sugar skulls, confronted her accidental escort. Reflection and ennui provoked fierce muse as black, blank canvas, loneliness as newfound agent. The sick bed transformed to atelier and Frida Kahlo, painter, model, and portrait, fleshing out the void with form and color. Once off her back, she kept company with a calming femme photographer, Chileno Bard and anti-Stalin Bolshevik. Wed a bon vivant mural artist whose wine of choice had to be full-bodied banner red, the gold of his labor sweetening Mexico's walls and plutocrat plazas, foregrounding erased miners and sugarcane workers. But Frida's brush decanted art from slant anatomy, limbed a spinal itinerary nail to a steel corset, rendered her body as biological epic, its sick bay odyssey, marital lacerations, cinematic paramours, a womanly dialectic of love and loss. Her dress composed a mestizo manifesto, chartreuse parrots and solar dahlias, a flutter in billowing lace fringe skirts and embroidered blouses, obsidian hair piled to a native headdress crowned with ribbon. Butterfly wings or floral nests dressed that neither Paris nor New York could occupy her closet or colonize her easel. Frida's signature unibrow and ghost mustache insisted facial hair is no strike against beauty unless she be prisoner to Don Juan's gaze. Imagine then International Women's Day, the debut of gravitas primped Barbie pimping Frida Barbie Callow as, quote, iconic inspirational woman. More browbeaten than unibrow, her bald upper lip, reedy neck, and stick figure arms gringle the role model as a ripoff artist playing to the mommy's sweet spot. A vacant face, faint Frida to thin out the competition and expand the brand to its rightful take of the feminist pie. Barbie never admits her falsy logic and dark plastic art, cannot unpluck or as youthful radical brandish the hammer and sickle. A hollow tribute, Barbie can only see the callow Frida she opts to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. I love that poetry, especially your second one. It was really inspiring. Okay, so we move now to Robert Priest, who is the author of 14 books of poetry, three plays, four novels, and lots of musical CDs, and one hit song. His words have been debated in the legislature, posted in the transit system, quoted in the Farmer's Almanac, and sung on Sesame Street. His book, Reading the Bible Backwards, peaked at number two on the Canadian poetry charts. His latest recording, BAM, is available on Spotify, YouTube, and iTunes. So welcome, Robert. Thank you very much. Okay, this is called If I Didn't Love the River. If I didn't love the river, how could I say I love you? If I didn't wish for the world to thrive, if I didn't work to change minds, that wouldn't be love. I love you because I love tomorrow, and I want to keep it just a day away forever. If I saw hunger and didn't dream of a feast, if I didn't dream of children well-nourished, what would nourish my love? What would my longing for peace grow fat on? 
my love of justice is all wound up in my love for you. It wouldn't be love if I didn't love creatures running free, if I didn't support the right of others to love. It wouldn't be love if I gave away my voice so others could add it to the mob. There has to be work to it. There has to be vision. If I didn't love the scorned, the othered, if I didn't love the children of war, how could I truly say I love anyone? This is, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Othering. The baby is being othered. That's the othering process. She has othering pains. Her m other, her f other, her br other. Everyone others her. That's otherhood. We other and get othered. That's otherization. And me other and me other and me other. We can even other on mass and be mass othered. And some come pre othered. We other the genders. We other the races from one and other. The sky others from the waters and the waters from the earth. We other the night from the morning, the moon from the stars. Your grandfather and your grandmother, everybody others you. Oh, my lover, I suffer. I don't want to be your be othered. Is there no unothering? Must we forever be each other's other? How do we get de-othered? I beg you, please, unother me. Unother me. Never. Never. Here's a sonnet called Proper Terror. Despite your best efforts, there will come a time when terror strikes so fast you grab someone and hold on with such a grip for dear life you leave fingernail gouges in their skin. In order to reduce infection then, disinfect the nails and make sure they're trimmed back to the quick each hour without fail. And never puke in fear nor avoid the bowels. If you must scream in public, be aware this can disperse a virus far and wide. Even if you are burning, please take care to shriek into your hands and turn aside. These courtesies, in war as much as peace, apply also to beatings by police. I like to come up with um, positive ideas to uh, improve the world. Um, and this is one of them. It's called Idea for Genetic Engineering. What if there were a moral act orgasm? A new way to come because you stand up for a just cause. A way to come if you're whacked by a baton in a protest. A way to come wonderful if you're tear gassed and handcuffed. What if there were dirty little booths on Young Street where you could furtively give huge amounts of coin to charity and have an orgasm that just foams your bones? It would be so erotic to be in Doctors Without Borders. If you were a pro bono lawyer against Monsanto, you'd hardly be able to walk for the orgasms. What if we found a gene splice to make us lust for peace in the streets like it was the love of our lives? What if only truth could get us hot and bothered? We should be re-engineered so that the only way to really get our rocks off is to end child poverty on earth. <laughs> this is called progression of butts. I shouldn't be saying this, but typically the majority stand for it, but they assumed we'd go on being quiet, but they said that moral courage was at a minimum, but they thought we'd go on stunned in the gray TV glow, but they thought we were flies on the screen forever, but even we believed we had no wings, no grandeur, but they thought our outrage was dead. But there's supposed to be limits on how long you can push it, push it, push it, push it. But, but, but we thought we'd lost each other. But 
They believed that silence was ascent forever. But it looked like it was going to be World War III, but they said that faith was not a well, not a flow, not a channel. But I was telling everybody, don't count on me. I can't be relied on. But they're going to tell us we're not brave. But they're going to push the negative. But they said there was no buttress, but no resistance, but no insistence, but no victory, but. And a few little one word poems to end up in my last 30 seconds. Respect your youngers. I'm so old, I have an inner adult. I'm waiting for whatever supersedes the supersedes. The worst thing dominoes can do is stand together. The reason love gets deeper and deeper is so we can keep falling in it. May your evils fade and your good works outlast you. Our secret power is each other. Of all the materials used by the ancients to ensure the longevity of their edifices, it is the glass ceilings which have best withstood the test of time. Shame is the new fame. A farewell to arms dealers. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I'm sure wonderful poetry, and I'm sure you're leaving our audience. I know you're leaving me with a lot to think about. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so we, you're welcome too. So let's move now to uh, Sasmita Ray, who is an Indo-Canadian living in Brampton, Ontario. She is a PhD scholar in physics, and she was an activist with science and rationalist associations affiliated to the communist parties in India. She is a friend and supporter of socialist action. So welcome, Sasmita. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Susmita, and I am presenting a poetry written by a young, bright poet named Amir Aziz from India. Amir is a research scholar and a progressive poet from capital city of India. Uh, this poetry touches upon the incidents of atrocities and uh, injustice committed by present Indian government uh, to impose its, its uh, fascist agenda and policies. India saw a chain of resistant movements uh, developing against this. Uh, some great young poet activists like Amir evolved during these movements. Amir read this uh, poem in a program named India My Valentine in Bombay on 16th February 2020. Uh, this poem was also recited by Roger Waters of Pink Floyd at a protest program in London. Uh, Amir dedicates this poem to Kashmir Aligarh University, Jamia University, State of Uttar Pradesh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and City of Delhi, uh, where uh, we witnessed large number of fascist attacks. Uh, I'm going to read it in its original language, that is Urdu Hindi, uh, and then I will read it in English. Sab yaad rakha jayega, sab kuch yaad rakha jayega. Tumhari laathiyon aur goliyon se katl huye hain jo mere yaar sab, उनकी याद में दिलों को बर्बाद रखा जाएगा सब याद रखा जाएगा तुम स्याहियों से झूठ लिखोगे हमें मालूम है हो हमारे खून से ही सही सच जरूर लिखा जाएगा मोबाइल टेलीफोन इंटरनेट भरी दोपहर में बंद करके सर्द अंधेरी रात में पूरे शहर को नजर बंद करके हथौड़ियां लेकर दफ्तर मेरे घर में घुस आना mera sar badan meri mukhtasar si zindagi ko tod jana mere lakhte jigar ko beech chaurahe pe maar kar yun beandaaz jhund mein khade ho kar tumhara muskurana main apni haddiyon pe likh ke rakhunga ye sare wardat tum jo mangte ho mujhse mere hone ke kaagzat apni hasti ka tumko saboot zarur diya jayega ye jang tumhari aakhri saans tak lada jayega ye bhi yaad rakha jayega ki kis tarah se tumne watan ko todne ki saazishein ki ये भी याद रखा जाएगा कि किस जतन से हमने वतन को जोड़ने की ख्वाहिशें की जब कभी भी जिक्र आएगा जहां में दौरे बुजदली का तुम्हारा काम याद रखा जाएगा और जब कभी भी जिक्र आएगा जहां में तौरे जिंदगी का हमारा नाम याद रखा जाएगा कि कुछ लोग थे 
कि कुछ लोग थे जिनके इरादे टूटे नहीं थे लोहे की हथौड़ियों से कि कुछ लोग थे जिनके जमीर बिके नहीं थे इजारेदारों की कौड़ियों से कि कुछ लोग थे जो डटे रहे थे तूफान नूह के गुजर जाने के बाद तक कि कुछ लोग थे जो जिंदा रहे थे अपनी मौत की खबर आने के बाद तक तुम रात लिखो हम चांद लिखेंगे तुम जेल में डालो हम दीवार फांद लिखेंगे तुम एफआईआर लिखो हमें तैयार लिखेंगे तुम हमें कत्ल कर दो हम बन के भूत लिखेंगे तुम्हारे कत्ल के सारे सबूत लिखेंगे तुम अदालतों से बैठकर चुटकुले लिखो हम सड़कों दीवारों पर इंसाफ लिखेंगे बहरे भी सुन लें इतनी जोर से बोलेंगे अंधे भी पढ़ लें इतना साफ लिखेंगे तुम काला कमल लिखो हम लाल गुलाब लिखेंगे तो तुम जमी पे जुल्म लिख दो आसमान पे इनकलाब लिखा जाएगा एंड नाउ आई विल रीड द इंग्लिश ट्रांसलेशन ऑफ दिस पोएट्री वी विल रिमेंबर एवरीथिंग वी विल रिमेंबर इट ऑल द मर्डर्स विच हैपन विद योर स्टिक्स एंड बुलेट्स माई फ्रेंड इन मेमोरी ऑफ दोज वी विल कीप आवर हार्ट ब्रोकन वी विल राइट यू यू विल राइट लाइज इन इंक वी नो इट वेल मेड बी विद आवर ब्लड ट्रूथ विल श्योरली बी रिटर्न suddenly in an afternoon stopping mobile telephone internet in cold dark night imprisoning the whole city taking hammers in hands suddenly barging into my house breaking my head and devastating my simple life killing my beloved child in the middle of the road you uncountable number of you standing in groups and smiling everything will be kept in memory talking sweet on face during the day assuring that everything is fine with the stuttering tone and as night arrives beating with sticks shooting them who ask for ask for their rights attacking us and calling us the attackers as well i will carve these incidents on my bones you ask me for the documents of my existence you will surely be provided the proof this war will be fought until your last breath it will also be remembered how you conspired to disunite the country it will also be remembered how we tried and desired to keep the nation united and whenever there is talk about cowardice in the world your deeds will be remembered and whenever there is talk about the real way of life our names shall be mentioned that there were some people whose intentions were not shattered with iron hammers some people who didn't give up and never got sold to the pennies of riches some people who stood until the deluge was gone some people who remem who remained alive even after the news of their death the eyes may forget to blink the earth may forget to revolve but the flight of our cut wings and the sounds of our sore throats shall always be kept in mind you ride the darkness we will ride the moon you put us in jail we would jump over the walls and write you file fir against us we are ready for it and write still you murder us we will still write as ghosts we will write all the evidences of your murders you write jokes sitting in the court rooms we will write justice on the walls we will speak loud enough that the deaf can hear blind can read it we will write that clear you write black lotus we will write red rose you write atrocities on earth revolution will be written on the skies so that your names could be cursed forever so that your so that your statues can be painted in black your names your statues will be kept alive thank you thank you thank you uh, that was a beautiful poem very inspiring passionate and strong words so thank you samita and to and to the author of of that poem okay so let's we're going to stay in brampton actually and we're going to our next um, reading of poetry is armel mirraj is a grade 6 student in the international baccalaureate program in peel district school board he is a member of earth rangers which is a canadian environmental education and conservation organization greta thunberg inspires Avramel, who writes poems on social issues, nature, love, etc., and he is the son of Sumita. So, welcome, Avramel. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so, today I will be reciting a poem that I have written about the crisis that we are facing right now. And uh, without further ado, here it is: Coronavirus, COVID nineteen. Today, these words are 
a no surprise to be heard. It has been almost four months in quarantine. It feels as though we had freedom and in a matter of months and a few speeches later, we ended up at home. School closures were not that behind either, though late by three months. We might have thought that we're in the modern times and that nothing can stop us. Yet here we are making Zoom our classrooms, emails a new hobby, and that skateboard in our basement to good use. We might think that this virus was just too much for the human race to handle and that the cure is coming in the near future. But we need to understand the truth. Capitalism is the real virus. Capitalism is the virus. Construction workers, taxi drivers, factory workers, sanitation workers, automobile workers, mine workers, farmers, and many more who produce, who manufacture, who construct, who cultivate, who distribute, all lost their jobs. But managers and supervisors are working from home. Plane dis uh, planes disappeared from the sky and toilet paper from the aisles. Now cities look like villages and malls like graveyards. Coronavirus is spreading faster than the internet speed. Social distance to contain the virus. Social distance from the Democrats, liberals, conservatives, and Republicans to contain capitalism. Wear a mask to save your life, but unmask the Democrats, liberals, conservatives, and Republicans to save your life. Capitalism is the worst. Capitalism has atom bombs, rockets, missiles, and guns, tanks, fighter aircraft, submarines, all with the ability to kill many. But alas, not enough $4 masks to help any. Capitalism proudly sent astronauts to outer space. But alas, not enough doctors down on Earth. Then we heard from the president of the country that has been struggling the worst. We are in the process of defeating the radical left, the Marxists, the anarchists, and clueless agitating mobs. But alas, he has no clue what to do to save his dying nation. Cuba is sending doctors around the world to save humanity. But alas, the richest country just north of it is using its money and sending armies to kill. Capitalism is the virus. Black lives matter. Indigenous lives matter. Women's lives matter. LGBT lives matter. Alas, for the capitalists, only profit matters. Believe me and trust me. At least listen and understand. We live in a system where money matters. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We need to see. We need to wake up because the real world only cares about money. Capitalism is worse. Racist maniacs in the cities of a superpower, New York, Seattle, Washington, are yelling, China virus, China virus. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Corona is pressing down on my chest. Racism is kneeling on my neck. And capitalism is crushing my body. We're in this mind illusion where nothing can stop us and we truly have freedom. But a virus outbreak had the power to halt us. The virus might have left us stranded, like on an island, but capitalism was the ship captain. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. With young people like you, I think our future is safe. So let's 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 hope you spread the word because it's such such a great poem. Such a great poem. Okay, our next uh, poetry reading is Corey David. He is a member of Socialist Action, a political activist and artist focusing on social issues and anti-capitalism. He has worked as a machinist for the last five years in Vaughan and Scarborough. Prior to that, he worked six years supporting individuals with intellectual disabilities at Community Living Toronto and the TDSB, a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus running twice for NDP president. Corey is a proud Scarborian and a member of the working class. So welcome, Corey. Thank you. I've got a couple of poems here I'm going to go through. Um, the first one is called uh, Risk. I just came up with the name. Anyways, so it goes, the drum beats on from dawn till the sun's gone into the darkest corner and the mass is still moving. Another thousand devoured and cast in. They call it a clash, but the violence coming from one end. I had never seen a boss pulled into a machine. Forgetting, forget getting torn up. He's got to stay clean in every way except ethically. Shit's beyond questioning moral authority to endorse genocide. 
need permission to live when you're Palestinian. What's yours is mine. Heritage, identity, and religion is a crime. But to blow up mosques and children, that's just fine. So long as the dollars keep coming in, handshaking, pens signing, prying eyes, no one sees them till they die on the street corner, getting high or shooting up the club. Every crisis has its alibi. Trouble of your youth generational trauma, gun sales on every block, or 20 years of war in Iraq. Doesn't it take you back to Vietnam or the Philippines? Imperialist powers knows no history. It simply consumes at blistering speeds. Led by the hungriest of thieves, the capitalists would cut down all the trees, no matter how green, as long as its profits succeed last year's. The next poem is called Work. Media lights up the stage, hate the homeless and the migrant slaves, taking your job that you need to scrape by, never, but never illuminate the ruling class disguise. Scream and yell, threaten and shell, all in the name of democracy upheld, all in the name of, of burnishing earth to hell. What does it mean to be passive in this oppressive place? A sin to question authority, a crime to live on land that is not yours, that by document, and even then it depends on the business at hand. Consultations with corporations, residents can get bent. Elect election came and went. The candidate's more two-faced than Harvey Dent. Bureaucrats getting the most value despite producing none, nothing without you. How about awards and a lifelong salary? You could appreciate if you weren't paycheck to paycheck, terrified of making mistakes. Your mind are mad at you for being late, but don't pay you enough to make rent. So the bank looks great, but then they can't lend to you. They point across the street. Cash money, they own it too. And it's got the power to leave you in crushing debt without having a clue. Don't worry, they celebrate your losses over fine wine and steak. Even more things they didn't work to create. And the final poem that I'm going to read is called uh, Grab It By The Brain. Disintegrate your brain like lollipops. Can't trust these cops. Even those that earn hard when his brother handing out batons, watching it burn. Got these plans caught in your thoughts, mind rod. Revolution brings a lesson. Won't you look me in the eye? Shoot me in the head? I can't even die. So worthless my thoughts you can't even buy. Tongue tied, wrapped in lies. I try and I try to rise above this guise, but the smoke getting thicker. Release a statement, who can react quicker? Window wiping calls for a clean edge. How about a hair trigger? Broken glass, I only see them pointing fingers. Right to left, hedging my bets. Gambling ain't for the soul. Gotta risk everything, just a, hand, just a candle to hold. Tell him how it is. Told me every switch to top to bottom. Happened so fast. Had him in the grave before we even shot him. One thing I told him too, this fool could teach himself what he had to do. Falling across the line, grasping at Penelope's and Sue's. She ain't for you. Can't handle the bruise. Hire an escort. Need protection. Direction. Breathing down walls ain't gonna, breaking down walls ain't gonna be such a thing as defection. Shook that reflection. Forget the lips and the lashes. Tell me what you see before it's ash to ashes. I'm begging you. Look me in the eye. Shoot me in the head. We can't ever die. That's my poems. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Great, great poems. Great poems. Okay, so we will wind up our poetry tonight with Malou Baumgarten. And she's a photographer and a poet who formerly worked as a cultural producer and journalist in Brazil and has lived in Toronto since 1997. She has published in Journal de Brazil, Zero Hora, Washington Times, London Day, Daily Mail, the Toronto Star and Journal de Toronto, among other media. Malu traveled extensively in Brazil, Europe and North America. She is interested in social equality and believes that housing is a human right. Malu. Hi. So uh, uh, a picture has how tonight. Uh, I wrote it some years ago based on something that I saw even before that. So I'll read it for you and uh, I, I guess it speaks for itself. The man is sitting on the ground under the sun in the desert. A black pointy hood made of rough, thick plastic covers his head and is tied around his neck, leaving out only the long dark hair that falls on his back. The man wears a white tunic made like many Muslims do in his country. Through a spiral of barbed wire fence, I see his feet tied together. He is a prisoner of the soldiers of freedom. The child must be four years old, a barefoot sweet boy. He leans on the man 
as he sits by his side. The man's right arm is around the boy's shoulders and his left hand holds the child's forehead. The child's cheeks, round and plump, attest to his early age. He's crying and hurt by the burning sun of the desert. Or perhaps he's too tired and afraid to cry. And it is his desolate expression that makes me think he's crying. His eyes are closed and he looks exhausted and sick. What is happening to him and why the man his father sits there under the scalding sun, head bagged in dark plastic, just like the prisoners tormented in Abu Ghraib not long ago, legs tied, powerless to care for this terrified child. He is not a big man and his hands are workers' hands. The child is small and pretty and must be loved by the man, for he, head covered in black plastic under the sun, seems to feel not his own pain, but the child's suffering. The man is not about himself there. Every strength he has left is to suit the child. Was he beaten up? Has the boy witnessed it? The man and the boy are prisoners. Their captors call themselves the freedom troops. They have come to liberate this country from the likes of Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. For many years now, they have been liberating the civilian population from such things as their families, land, food, and above all, dignity. What happened to this man and his child? It has been a few years since I have seen the picture and I cannot forget it. The soldiers of freedom are still in Iraq and Afghanistan. Sometimes one of them dies and then America cries and sends in a fresh shipment of men. What happened to that boy? I see his face in my dreams and I feel ashamed of my impotence, of my vain poetry, of my useless humanity. <clears throat> He's there somewhere with beaten up and raped children with children who have vultures waiting to eat them while still alive. He is in this dark corner, this bottomless pit, this blind terror that fills my nights when I think how terrible it is to live surrounded by people who choose to be blind and deaf when faced with cruelty. Nobody reacts. I pray to my fear, never let me silence in the face of violence. Let me not witness brutality without a protesting word. Let me never blend in with the chorus of the apathetic. Be my friend, let my heart be broken if I try to give in to indifference. I am only afraid of not feeling. Thank you. Thank you so much, Milou. That was that was such strong words, but read with such passion. Thank you so very, very much. Okay, so now with the help of our technical producer Kurt, we've got a uh, we've got time, I think, for maybe a couple of questions and some maybe comments. Usually, sometimes our viewers, uh, audience, leave comments instead of asking questions. So I'll turn it over now to Kurt, our producer, with a couple of questions and a few comments. We have about um, 10, 12 minutes, um, Kurt. 
Okay, um, I'd like to just start by personally saying thank you to all our uh, participants for their great moving poetry, um, especially at the end. That was hard to take. I was almost brought to tears. So I will start with... Um, so Emily uh, Ellen Ramsey says, brilliant start. Thanks, Janine. Um, uh, let's see. Quite a few remarks from Ellen. Uh, I'll say she went and said, uh, enjoying Giovanna's poetry uh, reading style in great detail of the rail accident, George. Uh, from myself, it, uh, I said it is great that most of the poems have been on current events. Uh, there are two questions from uh, Ellen and Ramsey, uh, Ellen Ramsey and Barry Wiseletter, but I'll get to them at the end. Uh, dinner from Franklin says, sums up, yeah. Uh, Ellen Ramsey says, other, great poem. Uh, Peter DeGamma says, poetry is a powerful weapon against capitalism in Pakistan. Faid Ahmed Faiz, poem Hum uh, Deng, uh, Dekeng has been sung in anti-Modi protest and the student movement. Uh, I say, I can't help uh, but smile during Robert's poems. <laughs> Alan Ramsey says, yes, his poems are very amusing as well as thoughtful. And uh, let's see, uh, Barry Weisletter says, Aramel unmasks the guilty elites and venerates the unsung heroes. Robbie Mahood says, long live the poets. And Alan Ramsey ends off by saying, very powerful. So I'll go to the two questions by Ellen Ramsey and Barry Wiseletter. Start with Ellen Ramsey. She says, question to all the poets, does your poetry style rhyme, stands, or rhythm change with each poem or have you developed a style you stay with? And then Barry Wiseletter asks, Andre Breton wrote a surrealist manifesto in the 1930s. It was midnight of the century. Does COVID and depression make it time now again for a new manifesto of cultural rebellion? And he directs those questions to Giovanna and Jan. However, Jan is no longer with us on, on the presentation because she lives in uh, the UK and it's currently past midnight, so she had to leave. Okay, so uh, so I guess we'll go to the last question first because it it was under under uh, the directions we put forward of putting your questions to the one poet you wish to put the question to. So um, Barry's question to Giovanna. Oh, sorry, can you just repeat the question? It was about Andre Breton's manifesto. Was it time for another manifesto? Is that right? Yes, that is what he asked. That is basically it. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I'll just say that as a, uh, the Surrealists were a big influence on me. And uh, as you know, a number of them were communists, Paul Elward among them. And uh, their manifestos were uh, influence on uh, both the way I thought and uh, my poetry. And do we need a new manifesto now? Uh, that is an excellent question and one that I had not pondered. So just off the cuff here, I would say that given, given the times uh, that we're living in now, and also uh, the, the situation, the global situation with the rise of uh, right-wing populism, I, I think we need a, a manifesto that is uh, double-edged. Double one, that it provide a very clear analysis of uh, what uh, exactly is uh, the situation, into the power situation and the big ruse uh, that were uh, sold every single day in terms of distribution of wealth and uh, social justice, as well as uh, a call to action uh, for people, an inspirational call to action that uh, can unite people, something like what Greta did for the young people. So uh, I, I would opt to say yes. And I think uh, the poets would be great people to write this new manifesto because uh, they're visionary and they're also articulate and uh, the uh, power of poetry to inspire and move people to action 
along with the responsibility that knowledge, uh, knowing, uh, seeing situations, uh, the responsibility that knowledge bestows upon people, I think that would be a very, very fine thing. So uh, I'll leave you with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So the question uh, that Ellen put forward I, I about different writing different posts at, at homes at different times, or Kurt, you can put the question to, out again. But I'd like to go back to Robert and to Melu if they would like to. We have time for two to answer these questions if they wish. So, Kurt, um, could you put the question out again, please? Okay, so it's question to all the poets. Does your poetry style, rhyme, stanza, rhythm change with each poem, or have you developed a style you stay with? So, Robert, would you like to tackle that? Sure. Um, well, um, you know, I've I've had the privilege of being able to write poetry a lot, uh, about um, you know, forty-five years worth of it. As a child, I wrote, um, you know, metered rhyming poems. Um, as a young man, I and onward, I wrote uh, in free verse. With, uh, but I was also a songwriter, so I, I still kind of tuned into my rhyming metered self. Um, I also was affected by the Surrealists and the Surrealist Manifesto. Um, so I wrote a lot of prose poems, which were um, very freeing. I thought. Um, and um, I soon got into what you might call aphorisms uh, or, or, or uh, micro poems. I, I did a few of those at the end, little one, one liners. Um, I also wrote, write for children. So I think almost all of my children's verse has been verse, uh, whether simple sort of quatrains or um, uh, in my most recent book, uh, there was some sonnets and more elaborate verse forms along with um, along with uh, free verse. Um, I always knew that one day I wanted to try formal poetry, you know, in the sense of sonnets. So of late, among other things, I have been writing, um, you know, ba -dum -ba -dum -ba, iambic five beats to the line, 14 lines, rhyme scheme sonnets. One of those was the one I wrote about proper terror um, and I'm still writing songs so I've, I've, I've had many different forms to play with and um, it's it's been very gratifying I'll turn thank it you. over now okay thank you Robert okay Malu would you you would like to get in on this uh, yes uh, well uh, I the, the, poem, the poem I presented here is pretty much a, a, a prose, prose poetry. It's like a, it's telling a story. But uh, I, I write other things, and they they don't rhyme because you see, my 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 language is not English. I I come from another language, so the way the way even the way I use the words, I think it's a bit different. And this year I. I, I wrote in English, so but I do have I do have some kind I have some some things that I I do I have some kind of a rhythm when I write like a ballad a bit a bit uh, uh, a bit of a, a repetition system and uh, I think that is uh, that said each poem and uh, depends on what is inspiring me on that day and what is I want to, to write about. And uh, one other thing about poetry and writing, uh, being a, a writer of uh, prose, being a journalist, or being a person that writes other things, I would say that poetry is not writing, uh, like writing a book, writing a novel, writing a short story, like an a, a journalistic piece. Poetry is much closer to the fine art. Poetry is something that uh, I don't know it happens to other people, but for me to write, it has to really, I have to really get into a very, uh, I have to get in, inside it. That has to, to be, uh, has to be something that involves me and makes me suffer a bit. And that's why sometimes I don't want to write poetry, but I always do. Uh, I don't know if to respond to the question, but that's my take 
in, on poetry and my poetry. Okay, thank you, Malou. We have a couple of minutes left. George, would you like to say something? Really have anything to say, but thanks very much for asking. Okay. All right, folks. So I thank you because we've Evan, we're running out of time. So a special thanks, of course. This poetry was just wonderful, just wonderful. Uh, thanks to to Chris and George, and and Giovanna, Robert, Sashmita, Corey, Malu, Aromal, and Janine, all the way from the UK. So thank you so very much, and also, of course, to Kurt, our producer, and all those who participated in tonight's conversation. So please consider buying a subscription to Social Action newspaper, only $25 for one year, delivered to your door. To fill out the form, just visit our website, www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to talk to us about joining SA, uh, you can write to socialistactioncanada at gmail.com or just call 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. And once again, if you like the show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. Our next webcast will be on Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And it is time for the corporations with presenters Daniel Torre and discussion Emily Sears, Rachel Moran, Siobhan Bryan, and Bess Alcala. And I will be hosting the show. So for the details, just go to www.socialistaction.ca. So in the meantime, in between time, folks, please stay safe, healthy, and active, and bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank bye, you. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, Thank you. coming in.